and welcome to our in focus discussion this evening on adults living with autism. Did you know that Utahns on the spectrum lose the support of educational services from the state after they turn 22 years old? Some people don't even receive their diagnosis until after they've become an adult. Tonight, in honor of Autism Awareness in April, we are exploring the difficulties, the challenges, and the barriers that adults living with autism still face. Joining us now, live in studio is Jason Brentner and Havoc, I'm gonna say this right, Lucivia, both individuals living with autism. Thank you both for joining us tonight and welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Yeah, so we'll start with you, Jason. Can you share a little bit about how you, you've lived experiences as an adult on the autism spectrum? Yeah, that's uh, it's a difficult journey, but uh, I was not knowing until I was 36 and uh, I was bullied in school. I uh, struggled with relationships, uh, being a parent. Um, I was homeless for a few years. Hmm. Uh, just, I was an opioid, opioid addict um, for nearly 15 years and I've just had the last 10 years of uh, living without opioids. So that's uh, where I'm at right now. I'm still trying to recover from all the traumas I've seen and I've uh, faced not knowing who I was. I'm sure we're gonna get into this, but all of this, now that you have your diagnosis, do you think you could have avoided a lot of this or, or no? Hmm. That's a, that's a difficult one. It's, um, I think it would have helped um, for sure, uh, but I, I can't answer that really. Right, right. That's kind of hard to be put on the spot to even have to think about that, right? Mm -hmm. Well, Havoc, let's ask you too. When did you get diagnosed and how is that process for you? I actually didn't get diagnosed. Um, I haven't even pursued it um, and I haven't needed to. I have known my whole life though, because um, I was, my mom had a friend who was a doctor and I was just organizing pencils in, in rainbow order and then scrambling them and then height order and then re-scrambling them and then in mm. rainbow order backwards and like the, our, our play looks different. So I was doing that and my mom's friend was like, you know your kid's autistic, right? So I've always known, but I haven't have felt the need to um, pursue a diagnosis. It hasn't been worth the effort for me. It's hard to access, so. My goodness. All right, and Jason, we kind of asked this, but in a different way. Just how different do you think life may have been if you received that diagnosis earlier or when you were a child? Would you have had more help or had more resources, do you think? What are your thoughts? Absolutely. I think having those, the diagnosis earlier would have got me onto programs, uh, helped me um, specialize education, um, independent living, um, it, you know, assistance, things I struggle with up until, you know, I still struggle with these things. So those things would help me with life skills. As far as where I'm at right now, I don't know. Right, right. Some of these questions, they are deep and you guys are so kind and so willing to be here on the show to chat with them and be uh, very vulnerable and intimate. So thank you for that. Thank Jason, you. how did it feel or impact your life once you got the diagnosis though? Uh, let's think about that earlier. And yes, um, having that diagnosis helped me find kind of a, a starting point for myself. I'm um, able to begin a journey of learning about who I am, what, I, you know, what kind of person I am, something I never had as a kid. Um, but having that identity helped me uh, discover new things about myself and what I'm capable of or what I could be capable of. So I found new hobbies, new things that you know, move me. Uh, activism became a first part. Um, I think being in service to others uh, and uh, trying to make a better path forward for those behind me. Uh, kids who are growing up without knowing or face those similar challenges. I like to be able to show maybe there's a better way to achieve some of these things I've gained. Insight, peace in mind, um, power, forgiveness, things like that. That's an incredible um, depth you have there to be able to share and think outside of yourself and what you can do for others. And Havoc, we're going to ask a question in just a moment. One more for Jason, though. What kind of difficulties, challenges, or barriers have you faced when trying to seek resources as an adult living with autism? Give us an idea of what that's been like. First and foremost, uh, uh, the obstacle gets in the way the most is uh, childhood trauma. Um, feeling left out in society, feeling um, you don't really belong, things like that. So. And, Seeking help is hard when you don't really believe in yourself. And um, I do now, I have a lot of self-esteem now with where I've been, what I've gone through, but um, that's kind of why I'm doing it, <laughs> is uh, to lessen the trauma 
and it's hard to think about right now, but I'm trying. You <laughs> are you. trying, which is half the battle, right? Just mm -hmm. putting yourself out there. And what are the gaps that exist between resources for children with autism versus adults with autism? I think a lot of the gaps are um, in part because a lot of the resources are there for the children's parents, um, for making the, the, the children easier to deal with for the parents instead of um, teaching, it, it's arguable, but instead of teaching children how to accept their autism and, and live in society with the autism, um, which means as soon as the kid grows up, then there's none of that um, help available to them um, because it's specifically for parents. This is so insightful. I'm at the phase in life where I have young kids and I have friends with kids that have been diagnosed with autism. So the talk really is lots of times focused on these kids, but I love that we have the chance to have a discussion of adults with autism and the difficulties and the resources that you need. I'm Jason and Havoc, we want you to hold that thought. We do have to take a quick commercial break, but when we return, we'll resume our in-focus discussion again on adults living with autism. All right, thanks for staying with us for our second In Focus discussion tonight on adults living with autism. Before we went to break, we were joined by Jason Brentner and Havoc Lucivia. Um, Lucivia, I want to make sure I get that right, Havoc. Both individuals living with autism for a live panel discussion this evening. Now we're going to pick up right where we left off, starting with you, Havoc. What are some misconceptions that exist about adults living with autism? misconceptions um, that we don't have feelings that's that's like the biggest one we have so mm. many feelings we just don't show them the same way as neurotypical tend to show their feelings um, I mask really well so I'm I'm able to to kind of get around that but a lot of people don't they'll they'll show their feelings by hiding or they'll rock um, and different stims mean different things but the misconception is that because we don't show it in a neurotypical way then we must not have feelings at all and that's not true at all Ooh, and no one wants to be thought of as not having feelings no. because we all do. We're all human. Yes, what insight. Um, Jason, being on the autism spectrum, has that impacted your personal relationships, whether that's with family, friends, or even romantic partners? And then explain why. All the above. Um, and misunderstood is from my family, misunderstood from previous uh, partners, and... Um, Work was a definitely a struggle, you know, interpersonal work relationships. Um, yeah, it's a struggle. That's like the one thing that I would say autism is my weakness has been my uh, social skills. I'm working on it now. Yeah. But it's, uh, I can tell a lot of stories or just write a whole book on inter just relationships. And Will you the please? Spectrum. You need to write a book. You do need to write a book. Tell me then really quick too, Jason, we were chatting during the break and I would, I'd love the public to be able to hear this. We were asking about how you decided to get tested to get the diagnosis um, that you're autistic. Tell us a bit, a bit about that. About getting my test? Um, or I, how it even led to getting tested. How did it? Repeat, I'm sorry, one more time, please. You're okay. Yeah, you were talking about you were homeless at the time, and yes. that's how they helped guide you down this path where you were trying to figure out what was going on, and, and you happened to get the, the test, an autism test. Is that correct? Yes, uh, that's, that has been... Um... So that's, that's how you got the test. Sorry, I'm not meaning to confuse you. Tell me then, after <laughs> you got that test um, and you were diagnosed, that wasn't a very simple determination, was it? Or was it various tests that you had to take to try to figure out oh, okay. what was going on? Now, I, I get the question now. It, it was tedious, a lot of mm -hmm. questions, um, uh, interview stuff, mostly story, t you know, like show you pictures and tell you, have you tell a story. And it just kind of shows how you take in the world and how you uh, interpret it. Wow. And one of the biggest problems uh, that I found out through my test that kind of opened my eyes to my own um, uh, my own um, setbacks were that sometimes I will dominate a conversation. Maybe that's why I'm being a little shy right now is because I don't want to talk over people. And that's <laughs> been one of my biggest um, Achilles heels. And it was very prevalent on that test. It just said, you know, dominates conversation, talks over. And uh, so, yeah, the test helped me with that. It helped me uh, fix that. Right. And Havoc, um, in September, we want to go into this, a 13-year-old Utah teen who's on the autism spectrum made national news when he was shot 11 times by an officer. 
What are your thoughts about this and what do we need to discuss and explore when it comes to interactions between law enforcement and individuals who are on the autism spectrum? Yeah, that's important and that did not need to happen. Um, I think a lot of times, oh gosh, um, this is hard for me to talk about because I've been a victim of police brutality as well. So I'm gonna just stim my way through that. Um, I think that everything that Black Lives Matter has been talking about in the last, um, internationally, everything that they've been saying is, is really important and is, is helpful towards that. I think s stacking onto that um, is that there needs to be like training about how, um, like it, autism is a, is a processing disorder. So we're not gonna be able to understand what they're yelling at us. We're not gonna know what to do. We're not gonna be able to physically respond in the way that the that, that police are expecting when they're, when they're trying to respond to situations. Um, and so sometimes we will do stuff that is not what they want and then we will be injured or shot. Um, and it's important to train cops that that's a thing. I think we also need to implement um, nonviolent uh, response teams that are not connected with the police. Um, that are trained in specifically autism response and especially for all of that um, to um, make sure that it is also applied to people of color, to black people, to brown people because they are significantly, uh, autistic people of color are significantly more likely to be in danger in those situations. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be specifically addressed that that, that sort of training and those sort of implementations are in, are completely inclusive. How important that training is, most definitely. Thank you, Havoc. And Jason, what would you like the public to know about you and other adults living with autism? Now we're here, <laughs> very basic, but um, I'd like them to understand that we're here to share our stories. I'd like them to understand that we're open to it, most of us, and um, you, we have a lot of insight on how to, um, um, for you to help your children out or your students or a uh, loved one just you know talk to us and we could tell you how maybe we would have done things differently how what we wanted to have happen differently um, help you so these kids don't have to go through the same things we went through growing up and this maybe they can get to this place I'm at right now where I'm finding myself but with less trauma there you have it what a powerful answer what do you think havoc that the state needs to do to better serve our adult population living with autism Housing. <laughs> it is really, really hard to access housing and to main, maintain access to housing. Um, having uh, systems in place that help us access it, um, the, even the paperwork, the being able to afford it, the being able to maintain a job, as long as we have housing, then it's so much easier to contribute what we want to do and what we want to contribute to the community um, if we're housed and fed. Right. Basic necessities, right? Basic. Havoc and Jason, I hope you can take a big sigh of relief. You did a fabulous job with us here tonight to share, again, such uh, answers to intimate questions that we've been asking you. Thank you for joining us. Jason Bretner and Havoc Lucivia, um, thank you, thank you, both individuals living with autism. Thank, thank you. you. Once again. Yes, indeed. Well, coming up, a new facility opening up in Murray aims to bridge the gap in services for adults living with autism. Hear about the services that they'll provide and who will benefit from these resources. And welcome back to our third and final In Focus discussion tonight on adults living with autism. For those unaware, April is Autism Awareness. Earlier, you heard from two people who shared their lived experiences as adults on the autism spectrum. Now we're gonna to turn to a new facility that's opening up in Murray, aiming to bridge the gap in resources and services. Joining us now, live in studio, Heather Davis, the director for the new Adult Autism Center in Murray. Heather, thanks for joining us on the show tonight. We appreciate your time. Thanks for having me. So tell us first off, what prompted your organization to build a facility specifically for adults living with autism? So as you've stated earlier, um, funding ends after the education age of 21. So once adults turn 22, they no longer have access to services. So we wanna provide that continuum of care that allows them to access independent, vocational, and lifelong learning skills through our center. Wow, 
This is just fascinating and so enlightening. I didn't know personally before our discussion that, that it cut off at age 22, which autism just doesn't end when you turn 22, right? No, it continues across the lifespan. So we wanna really focus on educating the community about individuals with autism, but also providing individuals with support so they are able to access services and gain those skills they need to um, engage in meaningful employment opportunities and to increase their independence and lifelong learning skills. So tell us, yeah, what kind of those, what are those specialized programs, the care, the services, and the resources that will be provided at the new Adult Autism Center? Yes, so we'll be focusing on the population um, of autism spectrum disorder, which is co-occurring typically with a di uh, intellectual disability. So for those clients, we really need to focus on specific job skill training and increasing their independent skills so that they can demonstrate those lifelong learning skills and access more independence in their day-to-day -day life. Can you kind of explain the difference between the resources for kids and the resources for adults? Yes, yeah, so kids can access Medicaid and insurance pays for the services that they receive. Um, once you turn 21, those services are no longer offered. So funding comes from the Department of State of People with Disabilities, DSPD, and those will be the, service, the funds that we'll be accessing for our clients to continue to receive these lifelong learning, employment, vocational, um, and independent skills training. Okay, so who are the adults that will be served at the center? So the adults will serve in the center are on the spectrum of the autism disorder, but they also many times have a co-incurring intellectual disability. Uh, alongside that, they often have significant mental health needs that require um, a team of professionals to make sure that they're um, able to access the community and the day program that we'll be providing. Wow. So do you have other, any other, I should say, facilities or programs in the state to provide this type and level of care, services, and resources? Why or why not? Yes, so across the state there are programs that provide these types of services, but our program is specifically focusing on those who are more severely impacted by autism and have the co-occurring intellectual disability. For this population, there's little services and these clients often um, end up staying at home with their parents and they don't get access to the community or the resources that we have available in our community. So tell us to the Adult Autism Center is a big step forward in serving this population, but in your opinion, what else can we do as a state, as a community, as humans to better serve this community or what else would you like to see happen? It would be amazing to get more funding um, across the state for these individuals and it would also be amazing to have employers understand individuals with autism and especially those that are more severely impacted. So we're looking for employers who are willing to provide jobs to these individuals, but then also that funding that we need to make sure that we can provide this continuum of care across the lifespan. Why is this just happening now? Is this relatively new then, that these adults diagnosed with autism are receiving the care and are being seen the way they need to be seen? Um, I feel like there's more attention as children become um, adults and with the prevalence rate that we have in the state of Utah, it's important that we um, continue to recognize autism as a lifelong um, disability that impacts them and the supports that they need and the continuum of care. The clients that we will be serving um, often need 24 seven care. So their families are really relying on the community to help provide that respite and the support they often need. I really, this is so insightful tonight. Can you tell us too, Heather, just some of the hardships that you've seen? Are there, are there certain blocks that people keep hitting um, that you want the public to be aware about? If, if they have a family member or if they themselves mm -hmm. are dealing with this, what would you want them to hear? I think it's so important to access and um, find resources in your community that can help you. Valley Behavioral Health is doing a great job in providing the mental health supports. And then we hope to increase our supports in opening the Adult Autism Center. And I just would encourage anyone that's impacted by this or finding yourself not um, feeling that you can get the resources that you need to um, visit our website at www.adultautismcenter.org to find out more information about our programs. And we're happy to link you to other community providers or um, providers within our own center that can help you be more successful and have a more fulfilling life. And Heather, you may have already answered this, but again, before when we were in break and I was chatting with both uh, Jason and Havoc, they were saying that to get tested, 
is difficult as an adult and it's expensive. Is this something that you're seeing then and that it's something other people are probably running into? Yes, yeah, so we keep running into barriers and in trying to get adults tested and get the services they need. Um, we need more funders and payers to realize that they do need access to these resources and in order to access them, you have to be evaluated. Um, but oftentimes there's roadblocks in Medicaid funding and insurance funding and paying for these assessments. Mm -hmm. Paying for these assessments out of pocket is often very expensive and can be costly for families. So I think more attention to how we can extend that um, Medicaid funding and insurance funding into adulthood for individuals with autism would really help support the continuum of care and provide them access to services that they often need. My goodness, an important conversation to be having. Before we head out, Heather, when will the center officially open? And um, if there's anything else you want to add, we'll add it real quick. Yes, we are officially opening the first week in May, and we are very excited to provide supports to adults with autism across the spectrum. So feel free to reach out and check out our website. And we're just so excited for this new program and the services that we'll be able to provide. Okay, real quick, Heather, what's your website one more time? It's www.adultautismcenter.org. All right, thank you so much. You've been hearing from Heather Davis, the director for the new Adult Autism Center in Murray. Heather, thanks for joining us tonight and telling thank us you. about your new facility. It was great to have you. Thanks.